Well, thank you both for your papers. Uh, great. Um, I want to focus these comments around uh, three particular areas that I hope are going to sort of both tie the papers together and uh, refer to today's seminar as a whole. And these three areas are expertise, scientisation and feeling. And as Jane mentioned, um, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to introduce my own PhD project, which would actually have resonated quite nicely with the paper you would have heard from Emma Head, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, I work with women uh, who practice a philosophy of attachment parenting, and the stuff I'm talking about today is my work with women in London. Uh, typical practices amongst my informants include uh, long-term on-demand or full-term on-cue breastfeeding, baby wearing and co-sleeping. And when I say full-term breastfeeding, that could be anything sort of from uh, uh, one year old to about eight years old. So many of the women I encounter consider themselves to be sort of part of a social movement uh, distinct to mainstream patterns of care. Uh, now, I just want to put a little disclaimer in. Uh, I met my informants through La Leche League, uh, an international breastfeeding support organisation, but I want to make it clear right from the start that not every mother in La Leche League is an attachment parent, nor does every mother in La Leche League breastfeed until eight years old. OK, <laughs> so what am I trying to do? Uh, I'm trying to analyse current trends in parenting, basically, by exploring the processes of identity work, a phrase that Ellie mentioned earlier, or these narrative processes of self-making that adults engage in as they go about raising their children. So like other people here today, I'm arguing that the word parent appears to have shifted from a noun denoting a relationship with a child, so something that you are, to a verb, something that you do. It's now an occupation in which adults are expected to be both emotionally absorbed and become personally fulfilled. It's a highly reflexive, moralised affair where parents must act as informed consumers. And notably, parenting has also become an interest to policymakers, uh, thought to be both a cause of and solution to the problem of our broken society. That's a phrase from Jenny and Ellie's work. OK, so historicising what's new. Um, this is where I think Marianne and Gail's paper has been really helpful. The papers have been very helpful because they offer a genealogy of mothering. And we should be clear that it is mothering, not parenting, that these papers have been talking about. And they've been, doing, they've been talking about mothering over the last century. Now, this is helpful in trying to work out precisely what's new. Uh, and I think perhaps uh, Gail said it quite nicely in drawing on Sharon Hayes' work talking about intensive mothering, uh, where she says that ideal mothering, particularly in the UK, for a well-educated middle-class stratum at least, is intensive. And this ideal encourages mothers to spend a large amount of time, energy and money in raising their children. Each of these facets has historical precedent, as we talked about this morning, but arguably, arguably what is new is the way in which mothers are expected to constitute their very identities through their mothering. So what are some of the implications of this? Well, Frank Faraday, um, as we've uh, heard this morning, has argued that the notion of uh, parental omnipotence or causality, uh, inspired by the psychological studies that Marianne was referring to, is a flip side of a coin that considers children vulnerable and helpless. The interlocking myths, as he, put it, as he puts it, that experience during infancy determines the course of future development and that parental intervention determines the future fate of a youngster have a profound effect on the way parents structure their relationships with their offspring. And he argues, by grossly underestimating the resilience of children, they intensify parental anxiety and encourage excessive interference in children's lives. By grossly exaggerating the degree of parental intervention required to ensure normal development, they make the task of, par of parenting impossibly burdensome. So the agency of children is reduced at the same time <coughs> that the effect of peers and social uh, sort of climate on child development is eclipsed through this um, very specific focus on parents. And accordingly, a, a sort of highly interventionist uh, approach is legitimised on their part. And with studies stressing the importance of early, even preconception environment for infant development, again, as Marianne mentioned, providing children with the right kind of setting turns normal activities of parenting into a series of tasks to be achieved. So things like touching, talking and feeding aren't just ends in themselves, uh, but tools with which, uh, which parents are required to perfect if they're in to ensure uh, proper development for their children. And to draw on Nicholas Rose, the everyday experience of parenting becomes rewritten as a set of skills to be honed and perfected, <coughs> perfected if one is to achieve optimum outcomes. Now, as Mary Ann's uh, and indeed Helen's papers uh, made clear, even emotions like love can be used to promote certain types of self-understanding in children and parents. And it's, it's both, uh, which I think we should um, 
perhaps talk about a bit further. So things like increasing confidence, helpfulness, dependability, and at the same time is averting fear, cruelty, or any other deviation from the de desired norm. The conversion of love from a spontaneous sentiment manifested in warm affection into a parental function or skill is one of the main reasons that uh, parents are now told to enjoy their baby. And I can't remember which one of you had it up, but you had that up in your presentations. So again, to uh, use Nicholas Rose's terms, the mundane tasks of mothering have been rewritten as emanations of a natural and essential state of love. So this trend, and this is what I'm quite interested in, uh, actually has an instrumental effect, because what it does is reduce a complex relationship, relationship to a skill set. In an age of parenting academies, can you imagine what other relationships talked about in verb form would sound like? So what would wifing one's husband exactly look like? <laughs> or daughtering classes? Uh, and it would probably seem all the more sinister if these classes were directed at the cultivation of appropriate emotional interaction. Okay, so on to some thoughts about expertise. Now, as Gail showed, along with a child-centred focus, an important aspect of uh, intensive mothering is that mothers should refer to experts uh, when caring for their child. And again, this is intimately tied up uh, with what um, Frank refers to as the expansion of the mother's role and the various tasks she is expected to fulfil. In Parano Parenting, he argues that parenting is increasingly considered too important a job to be left to parents themselves to deal with. Ellie uh, likewise suggests that this, in turn, binds parenting to the job of risk management, at once creating and fueling the market for a plethora of experts who enable parents to avoid <coughs> certain risks and optimise their children whether that be you know, judo teachers or psychologists or cranio-osteopaths or whatever it might be. Again, this has, uh, as we were talking about earlier, this has the effect of reducing parental confidence to the extent that all parents may become tinged with some element of paranoia. And that's what Frank argued in his book. So the development of expert knowledge about parenting was intimately tied up with the rational, efficient management of birth and infant care, which became increasingly prevalent during the 20th century. And this is something you both commented on in your papers. With the increasing hospitalisation of birth, measurements concerning parental interaction and on infant development were collected by medical staff. They were observed over time, and on that basis, norms were sort of duly calculated. So things like infant growth rate or developmental stages and so forth. Now, the point I want to make is that these measurements were, they were taken under the auspices of enabling women to optimise their child, child's development. But the scales that these physicians used uh, in the medicalisation of maternity were not just about, uh, they weren't just measures. They provided new ways to think about mothering and were created, they created a logical gap between the expectation and the observed. As Hoskin, uh, a sociologist, I believe, who's worked on the accountability culture, says... Measures that are targets uh, precisely and systematically embody a confusion between the is and the ought, for their nature is simultaneously to describe and prescribe. So scholars who have analysed this accountability culture comment that since measures only report what is, they are seemingly unobjectionable. In fact, they also pre prescribe the ought uh, in the form of conscious or unconscious targets, and through the guise of being only for the best, they're sort of, you know, seemingly very mundane. <coughs> I'm going to return to this is ought um, below. So the almost inevitable misalignment between expectation and realisation produced by surveillance fuels the search for help and guidance in the difficult task of producing normality. And as Rose says, powers the constant familial demand for the is assistance of expertise. Since normal development becomes something to be achieved, it necessitates continual surveillance in the form of advice or support. Marking an important shift in the politics of family life, experts, so social workers, um, for example, assume a right to intervene if the child is seen to be endangered or potentially endangered. What's more, the images of normality generated by such <coughs> expertise come to serve as, uh, they sort of serve as a means by which individuals uh, can themselves normalise and evaluate their lives. And I think this is something that Gail's paper alluded to. And of course... Uh, something I think Ellie and Jenny have talked about in some of their work on intensive um, parenting culture is the way in which uh, expertise can corrode other kind of um, kinship relationships, for example, other sources of knowledge about parenting because there's this constant outsourcing to the third party, which we talked about earlier. Okay, so now on to some comments about science. 
Uh, Rima Apple uh, describes this, the ideology of scientific motherhood as one which designates good mothers as those who are guided by scientific information. And they are those who subjugate their own perspectives to the authoritative experts. Uh, and certainly an era of intensive mothering would celebrate scientifically informed expert forms of care. Now, using science is a, a trope very common to the world of parenting, as I'm sure you're all well aware, and this is what Frank was talking about earlier. Indeed, he's written uh, about the replacement of scientific evidence with a more generic science as a sort of trend on the increase uh, in contemporary Britain. And he says, Today, it frequently seems as if scientific authority is replacing religious and moral authority and in the process being transformed into a dogma. At first sight, it appears that science has the last word on all the important questions of our time. Science is no longer confined to the laboratory. Parents are advised to adopt this or that child-rearing technique on the grounds that the research has shown what is best for kids. Virtually every aspect of human life is discussed in scientific terms and justified with reference to a piece of research or appealing to the judgment of experts. So science says, studies are shown, as we were talking about, uh, are phrases which are frequently used to legitimate, he says, what might actually be moral debates about particular styles of care. Now this argument, of course, echoes a much, much older one, and that's David Hume's, uh, which he uh, outlines in the treatise concer concerning human nature. Hume's is ought distinction remains pertinent because in an era of evidence-based policy, uh, it, it's very uh, important to see at what point description has come, become prescription uh, because the sort of activities of parenting are not only about creating scientifically optimal children, uh, as, however optimal is sort of defined at the time. And so, again, to draw Frank, he says, science can tell us much about the world, but the meaning that we ascribe to these facts, and that is how we should act on them, is not always straightforward. Uh, if something is scientifically optimal for infants, six months exclusive breastfeeding, or if you listen to the women that I work with, you know, breastfeeding until the child decides when to stop, is that what mothers should do? So like the transformation of emotion into a skill, science has the capacity to flatten the quali qualities of the parenting relationship. And again, this goes back to what Marianne was talking about. Maternal love according to uh, the title of Sue Gerhard's book, Why Love Matters, for example, is no longer an enjoyable part of the parenting experience, but also a tool for optimising brain development. She relies on a lot of neuroscientific work to, to make that case. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about breastfeeding advocacy here, um, and Gail mentioned this as well. Breastfeeding advocacy, says Bernice Hausman, who's written on La Leche League in the US, most often looks to science to verify and value uh, to promote its interests. Such advocacy is problematic, she says, when it relies increasingly on the scientific case in its favour because that reliance simply, simply knits a complex biosocial practice ever more firmly uh, into science as a final arbiter of what we, as humans, should eat, how we should sleep and what kind of relationship we should develop with our children. So now I want to turn to more specific forms of scientisation, which I think was where Marianne's paper was very interesting. Uh, in fact, the use of scientific evidence amongst many of the lay groups in the parenting world is very, very common. And again, to use example from my own work, numerous scholars have drawn attention to the contradiction of the co-option of the language of science by you know, breastfeeding ab advocates. It's <coughs> ironic because their usual discourse is of anti-rationality, medicalisation or expertise. Uh, so another scholar describes how La Leche League was established as a movement privileging the expertise of mothers... Uh, so this experiential expertise you were talking about over the expertise of medics. Um, but nevertheless, as La Leche League's influence has grown, they've taken on much of the language of science. Now, of course, there's a distinction between medicalisation and scientisation that I think we need to be careful to make. Scientisation is held to increase women's authority, uh, but they are palpably kind of ambivalent about the role of the medic in the breastfeeding relationship. But at the same time, of course, these lay groups need to establish their authority and they can't be seen to be like quacks, <laughs> so to put it quite crudely. So it, um, they're very keen to use this scientific knowledge as a way of shoring up their position. And in, you know, they're now very well accepted amongst uh, these governmental and, in fact, non-governmental non bodies, such as the UNICEF Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. And I think what this shows is that science kind of becomes a levelling um, has a levelling effect in the relationship between these organisations to the extent that it's almost impossible now to tell these bodies apart. Uh, the one-size-fits-all approach encouraged through these programmes is particularly problematic where doing what is best uh, requires considerable work on the part of the mother. Again, the flattening eclipses areas of the mothering relationship to the extent that other pools on a mother's time are left in the shade. 
And just a final note on science. Referring to scientific studies showing the benefits of attachment parenting was very typical amongst my informants. I noticed that for some women, imparting this knowledge is a source of great enjoyment. As one woman puts it, she's super empowered by the knowledge that she has. In response to her marginal position, breastfeeding a five-year-old child, uh, validating her practices with science is one of the primary ways she accounts for her actions. It's also a critical way in that she establishes herself as a mother in relation to other mothers. She has an effect on... Uh, being super empowered, of course, has an effect on the relationship a mother has with her peers. And this is something that Gail mentions in her paper. This woman claims that she is not critical of other mothers because they don't uh, parent in a way that she finds morally acceptable. She'd never say that. Uh, but she says that she's critical because they don't do what is scientifically best. Uh, any moral disagreement is put beyond debate. Okay, I'm finishing up. <laughs> okay, so to conclude, you know, wh why is this so important? Now, being an anthropologist, I want to make the argument that the debates we're grappling with today matter for mothers and fathers in a very specific way that deserves to be made explicit. In Kinship Law and the Unexpected, Marilyn Strathern, another anthropologist, uses a vignette to make this point quite nicely. She discusses groups of middle-class mothers living in North London, describing how they attempt to control their children's habits, such as eating or sleeping. Now that the genes are set, mothers are occupied by risk avoidance and optimization, and the means of this is a constant subject of debate. But why the debate in the first place? Well, Strathern says... The young mother is placed in a position of responsibility by her knowledge of the effects of these substances on the growing body uh, and on the growing mind. The child seems to embody the conscientiousness with which the mother has acted on her own knowledge. And this is the important point. So why is this critical for the mother? Strathern notes that a parent shares body with the child twice over. First is the body of genetic inheritance, a given, a matter regarded colloquially as of common blood or of common substance. Second is the body that is a sign of the parent's devotion or neglect. And it is this, in this middle-class milieu, above all, through the application of her own knowledge, that the parent's efforts make this body. Strathern jokes that the child grows the mother. Thank you.